Hey friends, welcome back to my channel. Today we're exploring primary colors. Why is it important to understand color theory and primary colors? Well, all the other colors come from them. Primary colors are the only colors you can't create by mixing other colors together. I'm sure you already know this, but the primary colors are red, blue, and yellow. And from them, we can mix all of the other colors, our greens, our browns, purples, oranges, everything comes from primary colors. Primary colors are also important because they create moods in and of themselves. For example, red is often the color of passion or heat. Blue is a cooler color. It can signify calmness or even a sadness. And yellow tends to be a really happy color. So as an artist, understanding how colors can affect a whole painting, including the overall mood and emotional impact of your art piece, it's so important to understand how they mix together. So for today's video, I'm going to be using a set of handmade paints today. These are by 31 Purple Fish, and she sells her handmade paints through her own website. They sell out super fast. So if you want to grab your own set of paints, from Kelsey at 31 Purple Fish. I'll leave a link in the description below for that and check out her website on Friday mornings when she launches her paints. So the colors I have today are Trendy Blue, Warm Carmine, and Warm Yellow. I actually have little magnets attached to the bottom of these so they don't slide around so much. And honestly, once you start delving into the world of handmade paints, you might get addicted and you might end up spending a lot more than you planned on on paints. I have a few other colors here. In fact, some of these are really beautiful iridescent colors, also by 31 Purple Fish. But I'm getting distracted. Today we're just doing primary colors. I wanna show you guys what these colors look like, just pure on the paper, because they always look a little different on the paper versus in the pan. So here's our trendy blue. And I would say this one reminds me so much of just a cobalt blue or an ultramarine. It's a warm blue. And this whole set of primaries is considered a warm set of primaries. In fact, you can have warm and cool primaries. A warm blue tends to look a little more purple, and a warm red looks a little more orange. A warm yellow looks a little more orange as well. Let me show you the warm carmine. Beautiful color. I would say this is similar to my Holbein Scarlet Lake. And the third primary here is my warm yellow. And yeah, really beautiful warm color. So there they are. That's what we're going to be working with today to create our painting. Now you might be wondering, how do you get colors other than the primary colors? How do you get, for example, a black or a brown using just these three? You have to get a little creative with your mixing. In fact, to create a black or a brown, you're going to need all three of your primaries to mix them together. And of course, to get a green, you'll mix your blue and your yellow. And depending on the ratio of how much you mix, it will change what that green looks like. So if I want to mix in more yellow with my green, it's just going to look more like a yellow green. Now all of these colors, because they're all warm primaries, are going to produce fairly earthy tones. So these would be really effective to use in a landscape. To create purple, you mix your blue and your red. And because it's a warm red and a warm blue, they're not super close together on the color wheel. If I had more of a cool red next to my blue, I'd get more of a rich royal purple, but we're gonna get this really earthy purple with the combination of these. So again, when you have all warm primaries like this, you're gonna get some beautiful earthy tones. All right, so let's clear our palette a little bit and we're gonna make a painting using these colors. I'm gonna to try to paint really loosely today. So I'll be using just some larger brushes. This is a Princeton Neptune half inch flat wash brush. And this is my favorite silver black velvet size eight round brush. So today we're gonna to paint this cute little duckling. Grab your large brush if you wanna paint along with me. This will be in real time. And if you also have a set of warm primaries similar to these, go ahead and grab those colors and let's get started. My paper, by the way, is actually a crescent board. These are watercolor surfaces that are on boards and they're so great to work with because you don't have to worry about your paper buckling and warping, but they respond really similar to watercolor paper. All right, let's do a quick little sketch of our duckling in the water. I'm just gonna do some dashed lines because I don't want to make the fuzzy feathers overly outlined or that's gonna show up underneath the paint. So just dash little lines for the shape of the body in the water. The head is gonna be this circle shape and the little beak coming out. And I'm not gonna go overly detailed with this sketch because we're gonna keep it really loose and impressionistic here. I do want to indicate this little leg back here, swimming in the water, and the connection between the head and the back. You can 
suggest a couple of the ripples surrounding the little duckling as he swims. And that's pretty much it for the sketch. So once you have an approximation of where you're headed with the painting, you can go ahead and start. All right, I've got some paper towel here for blotting that is important for water control. Let's begin with some water. We're gonna paint clean water all over the surface of our crescent board or paper, whatever you're using for your surface. I like to start with the wet and wet technique when I'm working with soft, fuzzy things, in this case, the duckling. Its downy feathers are so fluffy and so soft. And so to create the softest effect where the feathers meet the background or the water, I'm going to need to use wet and wet. All right, so we're just painting our water all across the surface. Should be somewhat glossy, evenly wet all across. And then go ahead and grab your blue paint. You can swirl it in the palette ahead of time just to test the color, test the vibrancy. And if you're comparing this blue to the reference photo, it's way too bright, isn't it? The blue we see in the reference photo is much more muted, almost this slate gray. So to help with that, we're gonna mix in some other colors from our primary palette. Let's add a little red and a little yellow and see what happens to our mix. When we add the red, of course, it looks much more purple and we need to tone that down. So let's add in some yellow. Now adding the yellow in overpowered it a little. This might take some practice just experimenting with different amounts, different ratios of your paint colors to get the color you're looking for. So now I'm mixing in some more blue and I need to add in some more yellow. more blue. And the closer I looked at this photo, the more greenish this water looks to me rather than purple. So I think more yellow and more blue in the mix will create a better combination for us. So let's keep adding that yellow and I'm muddying up my palette here. <laughs> That's going to happen. Oh yes, but there we go. That's much closer. All right, so you may need to re-wet your surface. If you need to spray it, that can help. So with your beautiful slate gray color, let's start painting some water in the background. Because we wet the surface, it's really, really exploding on the surface of the paper. And we're gonna paint this around the downy shape of the duck's head, just avoiding the body of the duck and the beak, we wanna keep some of the white of the paper still there. You can let this wonderful softening effect happen. This is the beauty of painting wet and wet. You have to relinquish some control and just let the paint do its thing. And I'm loving this mix. This was mostly the blue, a tiny bit of the red, and some yellow. And I'm moving my brush using the flat end of my half inch flat brush to suggest the ripples in the water. I'm going to leave some of the white there so we see the highlighted ripples encircling our little swimming duck as it moves forward. This area of the paper wasn't as wet as this area and it's creating some interesting contrast and texture all this explosion of color wet and wet up here versus the more controlled wet on dry surface down here. I love how that looks. So just play with your water, just create shapes that you're happy with that are somewhat resembling the ripples of the surface of the water. And I'm dipping in the water and then watering it down here towards the bottom corner, but bringing it almost all the way to the edge there. All right, I'm gonna rinse that out. Now I need to clean up my palette. I need to clean up the surface here of my yellow. I need to restore that to a pure primary. We muddied it up with the blue. There we go. So with a clean-ish brush, Grab some of your pure yellow, and you can paint the first layer of yellow inside the duck's head. 
If some of that blue seeped into the head a little, you can just kind of push up right next to it. That's okay. Again, let the paint do its thing. And I'm leaving the left side of the head here white. Super soft, white of the paper. Wherever I see the brightest yellow, that's what I want to focus on right now. We see that a little in the hind leg here. Tail feathers. And you can use kind of a blotting motion with your brush to suggest the soft downy feathers. It doesn't look like much right now, does it? That's because we have let the paper and the paint do their thing. I'm actually going to bring the tail feathers in here a little closer to the hind leg. Just doing some little drawing adjustments here. And you may find working on a different surface like this crescent board, it just produces different effects than what you're generally used to with paper. So it's always fun to experiment with different surfaces for that reason. Okay, now I'm mixing my red and my yellow. I want to create more of an orangey color. The goal here is actually to create a brown. And I need a brown for the shadow tones inside of our little duckling. So I'm going to need to mix my yellow and my red and then a tiny bit of blue to neutralize that. And sure enough, we're getting a nice brown. Just a little bit of blue, not much. From there, we can paint the little separation of the head from the back, the underside of the head, and then we can do the beak. I'm going to do a first layer on the bottom side of the beak, and then on the top, removing a little bit of paint if it's still too watery. Starting to suggest some other colors on the on the duckling. Grabbing some more yellow. And it might be a little muddied by your other colors, but that's okay. We're looking for earth tones in this little duckling. Here I'm adding some dark shadows on the underside of the leg, sort of outlining the little leg. And then I'm going to begin to drop in some of the yellow color of the reflection of our duckling in the water. So you can actually do this while the surface is still a little bit wet to encourage a softening effect, but it's important to make sure that you don't have any extra water in your brush. So blot in your paper towel to control that. And then here in the water, right up next to our duckling, you can create the rippled reflections of the yellow of the duck's body. These can be painted in between some of those ripples that you left white, or right over the top of the blue, and it's going to create this almost brown color, which is what we see in the reference photo. Already it's beginning to look a lot more like water but very impressionistic. That's what we're going for. Now we can be begin to darken. I'm going to take that mixture that I made for the water again. So we're going to go under the duckling, darkening the water. I'm always glancing back and forth between my painting and the reference photo. And even though I'm really just loosely following the photo, it's giving me guidance for where to add my contrast and dark values. And that's going to be important to help it really pop on the page and ultimately look like a stronger painting. I'm going to add that dark color to the beak. And if it's dry, I don't think it's quite dry enough yet. Once it's completely dry, we can add the eye, but I'm going to need to wait on that for a minute. With these lighter colors, like the light downy feathers of this little duckling, you want to be more subtle with your tinted washes. That means adding more water into your paint and using less pure pigment. The only place we really used pure pigment on this painting so far was the bright yellow. 
and that's only in a few locations. Everything else is more of a complex mixture of our primary colors. So there's so many benefits to learning to mix your primary colors. You'll begin to understand your paints so much better and be able to predict what happens when you mix them together. So sticking with a limited palette not only helps you as an artist with learning and practicing your colors and learning to make better choices when you're choosing your colors, but it also creates color harmony within the painting. When you have too many colors in a painting, too many convenience colors, it can look busy and rather ununified. But working with just three is going to ensure that your colors are all unified, harmonious, and work together. So as I'm increasing the dark values, it's beginning to look a little bit more realistic but still loose and painterly because we did all of that wet and wet in the background. It's just sort of blended out, super soft edges. Many of them are lost edges and I love the look of that. Hopefully our little face on the duckling is dry enough that we can begin to add the eye details. So for the eye, I'm gonna take a lot of blue. Blue is gonna be your darkest primary. So work with that to create your darkest mixes. It's going to be mostly blue and then add a little bit of the other two primaries until you get a convincing black or dark brown something close to that keeping your paint mostly pigment only enough water to get it flowing look how dark we can get that it still looks pretty purple so I'm going to add a little bit more yellow and that'll help cancel out that purple yellow and purple are opposite on the color wheel so they neutralize each other. When you see that your mix is too purple, just add in some yellow and it'll look a lot more brown or black. All right, let's see how that looks on our little duckling's eye. And we can leave a tiny little highlight in there. Or not, I think I covered it up. Whoops, that's okay. And darken the underside of the beak one more time. While you have this dark color, use it anywhere that your painting needs to go darker. Mix in a little water if it's just not flowing for you. Aw, he's so cute. I'm going to add a few more dark ripples or streaks to the water, and then we'll call this little guy good. we go. If you want to make your duckling stand out just a little bit more, go ahead and re-wet your background one more time and you can add another layer behind your duckling. Either of blue or you can mix in the yellow to neutralize it, make it a little more green. But let's just darken a little bit more right behind the duckling. I want his little head to stand out. Yeah, that already looks better. But you can strategically leave some of your edges really foggy, like the tail feathers there. And then swipe along that edge to soften it out even more. And to suggest those super soft fuzzy feathers, we'll add a little more yellow along the back. And swiping. There we go. There's our finished little duckling using a crescent board and our handmade paints with primary colors. Hope you guys enjoyed this and were able to pick up some mixing tips. If you want to learn more about painting with the primary colors, I have an entire series that includes six different projects using a variety of primary colors, both warm and cool, and that's included with my Watercolor Mastery membership. I'll leave a link in the description so you guys can check that out. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next video.